Ladies and gentlemen, the incredible session we have coming up is that of a world champion. A glider that has, that has been a world champion for four times. He has set more than 60 world records. He is an author, he's a filmmaker, and he's an inspirational speaker. Captain Klaus Ullmann, the biggest round of applause, please. Captain Klaus, oh, you didn't even take the steps, huh? <laughs> I do. <laughs> well, we're so happy to have you with us, Captain Klaus. And your experience in the gliding industry and in the aviation industry, you're a champion. You're a legend. Yeah, uh, just let me say just some, a word for Jessica. It's uh, so unbelievable what she did, and I feel really nearly disabled as a speaker when, <laughs> when I heard this emotional uh, speech, it was unbelievable. I mean, having your session after her, is she, truly, she truly sets records. It was very, very, very nice speech. Indeed, and I'm, I'm indeed. Captain Klaus, you are a champion on your own. I mean, you're a legend on your own and you have been a world champion for four times. Was six times. Six okay. times. Oh wow! The last <laughs> I read online was four times, day yeah. by day, huh? Mm. Captain Klaus, we would love to know what started this passion in the aviation industry and what started your love in gliding in particular. Yeah, I have to go back perhaps a little bit to my six years. Uh, so uh, my mother made uh, some something in a magazine, and we won a prize to first flight. Uh, with a Cessna 172. Uh, so I was six years old and I was in this plane. And uh, so for me it was very, very impressive. I looked down, I remember always uh, when I looked down in the fields and the structure of the field suddenly get uh, very different. So you saw uh, homogeneous colors of the fields. So I was very impressed. But uh, so we were a family with five children. My father worked, but we had no problems. But uh, I remember always that uh, my mother said to me when I said, wow, this is, would be very nice. He said, yeah, you know, it's not for us. So this was a mind setting. Why? Uh, yeah, because uh, this is for lawyers, for dentists, for rich people, it's not for us. So, mothers don't lie, but they don't, know, not, they don't know always the truth in life. Yes. So, uh, four years later, I made my first uh, flight in a glider. So just, uh, we were on an airfield to show around or what perhaps a lot of people are uh, looking around on this uh, very nice event. And uh, so uh, I achieved, I would like to fly with this thing in a winch launch. And uh, so it was very impressive for me the first time in a glider. And uh, so this poor pilot, it was on a, on a high airfield and there was a valley down. I nearly uh, made him land in the, in the valley because I said, can we fly just a little bit more? <laughs> you couldn't get enough, huh? Yeah. But still, it was the same. We had uh, an airfield uh, just near our house, but it was not for us. And I needed really some time uh, to understand that whatever you will do in life, you can achieve it. It's just, it depends on you. It depends not on money. It depends on your passion uh, that you want to do it. I would like to say something for Sultan uh, because uh, we had a very special event when we met us. Uh, so uh, Sultan uh, came in my life uh, in a professional context. He wanted to fly with a glider uh, and uh, I could organize uh, with the Nimbus 4 DM where I made a lot of world record with his plane. Uh, so uh, he came to my airfield and uh, we looked around the glider and so he came with a helicopter and he said, yeah, you know, instead of going out and return, probably you can come with me to Mejev. Uh, it's an altiport uh, airport and 
uh, you can land there, spend the night in my nice chalet, and uh, then the next day you go back. I said, oh, I don't have a mountain qualification to land on this airfield. I felt bad. But he tried to get out the daredevil out of me. And uh, so, you know, daredevils in aviation is not always very good. Yes. So, you know, this speech about uh, the old and bold pilots, there are not yeah. a lot of old <laughs> and bold pilots. A lot of bold pilots, a lot of old pilots, but not a lot of old and bold. So I had a bad feeling, but uh, he arrived, he achieved uh, to convince me to land there. He said, you know, it's nearly like London Heathrow. It's a very big runway and so for a high airport, it's right, it's a quite a big runway. Uh, but still, I had not a good feeling. Uh, the reason was I had not the qualification to land there. So with a motor plane, it's a motor glider. Uh, I couldn't land with a motor because with a motor you land and you have to have this uh, authorization, the qualification. So finally, he arrived to convince me. We fly around uh, in this area. Uh, we flew uh, around the Mont Blanc, a very, very nice flight. And then uh, I, I landed there. I prepared the landing. But you know, you have to know when you have uh, the, 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 the thing, what you told me, it was uh, like London Heathrow. So I made the runway like that. So for me, the runway was like that. It's like, like London Heathrow. I was worried about to go too far because yes. the landing is quite. So, and then uh, we arrived there. Uh, so, and at a moment I had my speed and I was always worried not to go too far to hit the mountain at yeah. the end of the runway. That's not a good idea. But the problem <laughs> was that the airfield is like that. So, and I was too low and I was just incliding it. But I realized at the moment that there was no way to get around. You, you had just to fly. You had to do it. And uh, so that is one thing I learned in my life with uh, these 30,000 hours of gliding that I have. Uh, whatever happens, you made a mistake, you have to continue to fly up to the end. Whatever happens, you crash the plane, but you have to do it. So I arrived just to, to the, the left wing uh, to above a little forest, and there was a platform in front of the airfield, and arrived just to avoid oh a collision God. with the trees, and then we landed, but I could not uh, redress the plane, and so we made a ground loop, oh and wow. there was uh, just the, the tail of the, the glider broke. Just that. Uh, <laughs> and we had no insur uh, not nothing insurance, nothing. It was really a smooth landing for that. Just the wing was down and made a big round loop. The gear was out, so what, nothing happened. Uh, so, but. Of course, you can imagine that I felt really bad. So yes. I said, okay, I, I flew with Prince Sultan, it was so bad. <laughs> and uh, so uh, he invited me, he's in Charlie's, we had a nice evening uh, there. Uh, he, made, he, he said, you know, this was a, quite a good experience because I was not the pilot, it was not <laughs> my plane. <laughs> so, but I saw something, it was very interesting. <laughs> It so, was just my idea, yeah. but I wasn't the pilot. <laughs> I, can, I, so, can I make a comment? Uh, so I went course, home, Prince. just feel, felt bad. Uh, so, and what was amazing, and I have to really to, to say that, uh, Sultan, some months later or next year, uh, I had a phone call. You know, Klaus, I want to fly with you. And that, is, that was the moment when a commercial relationship turned into a friendship. Yeah. Because <laughs> I found it really very great and grateful for me uh, that I was not uh, the loser. So I find <laughs> I'm quite a good pilot. But, uh, and a good friend as well. I, I was, think Prince Sultan wants to say something. Can, yes. I, can I make so a comment? That, that was the relationship uh, that started yes. with, uh, with First of Sultan. all, uh, Klaus, we're lucky to have Klaus here. He's a world-class glider pilot. I mean, the things he does in his life, really, he won every award there is to win, but he flies the Andes, thousands, I think, I don't know, 30, 40, 50,000 feet. Uh, he flies over uh, the Himalayas, you should see the pictures, and Klaus always goes to the Himalayas and passes by here at dinner, and I would fly with this guy blindfolded. When we took off from, what's the name of the airport we took off from? Sir, my, my platform. That's right. Yeah. We, I, decide, I said, look, instead of flying five, six hours and coming back, why don't we fly to my airport, which is, like I said, you remember, I said like Heathrow, 750 feet, uh, meters, 
It's asphalted, unlike <laughs> his airport, it was like rough. But our airport is a one-way airport. You land one way and you take off the one way because it's surrounded by big mountains. And we studied the, the plans and everything. But I remember we decided to land with the engines on. The first time it's very interesting to hear that no landing with the engines because of the qualification. So I, and we talked to the airport manager, uh, Jack Brown, who taught me how to fly mountains and all that stuff. So uh, we explained everything. I knew the airport very, very well, and I glide to it all the time with no engine. So we came and go, went to all the points, and we came on the correct altitude. But then uh, I think uh, Klaus read the airport landing point, but the airport has an offset landing point because of the trees. So I, if you remember, Klaus, I was sitting in the back, uh, and then uh, I flew. I was tired flying for, I think, six hours or something from mountain to mountain. mountain. And then, uh, of course, his, his glider, and he's much more capable than I am. And the glider has big wings. I was actually inspecting it maybe to buy one. So I thought this glider has a lot of legs. And the airport is spooky because of the mountains in front. So when, I, when we came, we were all set for the correct altitude. But then Klaus took a 360 to lose more altitude. And I said, and I was sitting in the back, and I said, Klaus, I think we're too low. Yeah, that was too late. <laughs> too late. <laughs> and uh, then, I, of course, I knew it was too late. Yeah. But I thought, maybe this plane can have bigger wings that can go. So what I did is, uh, coming from the Air Force culture, we train for the uh, ejection seat. So I stuck myself to the chair, pulled in my, I breathed in, and I tied my seat belts where I can hardly breathe, and I grabbed the, there's two things I can grab in the glider, put my head in the backrest, and the seats are crash proof. And I knew we're going into these trees. If you could just look at the picture, Klaus, we have the picture now. Oh, wow. This is so where you, you see, landed? you see the airport, the runway? Yes, yeah, see the uh, left-hand side above. Yeah, you see the runway yes. way out there? Yes. The landing point is not at the beginning because they want it to be higher so you don't hit the trees. Yeah. There's an offset landing point. And in mountains, you don't look at the runway uh, size. You look at the inclination. So the runway is inclined, I think, four degrees or something, so you can stop easily, and you can take off easily. And this is considered to be the Heathrow of mountain runways. Oh, my God. <laughs> so we landed just in the spot. So below. the soft landing is we looks like that. by far too low. <laughs> it was really... Uh, but uh, when we came on the trees, I knew we were going to go to the trees, and I was worried about the river, a thousand-meter river. So we, uh, I tied in myself, and I, I did a little prayer for both of us. <laughs> and then we hit the, I can see the trees hitting the wings. I have to say that Klaus, amazingly, was in absolute control, even while hitting the trees, because he put the nose down, mm. not to stall. I remember that. Oh, then yeah, before that the field, the only way up. to survive. <laughs> exactly. Put the airplane, it hit the tail, broke, and it started spinning, and I'm, I'm holding on, looking behind me, to see how far the river is, because I don't want to go backwards. And, <laughs> and then the thing idea. stopped. I unbuckled quickly and came out, and Klaus came out. And uh, we measured our heart rate. It was like 50 or 52. <laughs> so I, the next day, we, we went to dinner. That's a plan, to stay with me in my house. We went to dinner. We started to dissect this problem. You know, we had a good time afterwards. The next day, I called... Dusse, who was here, who spoke yesterday. Yes, yes. And he brought the glider the day after, his glider. And of course, Klaus had a couple of people who came, his friends, picked up the glider and fixed it. I heard that this glider flew with two people who were doing a world record thing and, and hit a mountain in the Andes and both disappeared. Oh same my glider. God. The same glider? I, that's what I no, heard. No, 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 it was the same glider. Oh, so similar. There were, there were two champions. Austrian champion mountain, they, they hit a mountain in the Andes as well with this glider. Oh, that's a cursed glider, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> it was not this, it was the same type, but not the same. We okay, flew, thank uh, God. <laughs> it's like the Ken Hoffman story also, landing this on the This glider ice. is still flying. I flew the know. next day, I flew two days later, continued flying, and then, then I brought the other glider and went up, uh, when you left the, the next day, I went up with Dosé and we flew for seven hours. Oh, wow. Over the Mont Blanc, and we went up to 26,000 and oxygen and went into all kinds of things. The, the point is, people like Klaus, I learn from. You know, you have something like this happen. These things happen in cars, happen in uh, yes. motorcycles, bicycles. Yes. 
Two days ago, we had a, a boy riding one of those, uh, what do you call them? They rent them now in the Wadi Hanifa at night. He got hit by a car. Oh, wow. So, you know, and uh, so the point is, is you, us in the desert, we say, no horseman until he falls yes. or she. Yes. So yes. this is one of those stories. So this is, I think, the, my fifth life now expanded. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, it's I saw you, you landed on the ice as well. <laughs> that, was, that was before. <laughs> so. No, but it's very smart that after such an incident, God saved you, but after, after such an incident that you purposefully actually decide to go back into gliding right afterwards, yeah. immediately. So Sultan told me that he made just the next day, I made the next month, I made the stage to land on altiports and how to do it. And I realized it's not difficult, but there are methods to learn. And this is the message I would like to give to pilots. Uh, so my, uh, at first, my, my lesson learned was feel your belly and the belly didn't say no, you should not do that, and then I did it, and I think it was much better, it would have been much better to say, okay, Sultan, you know, I, I have not the qualification, let's land in Albertville or in Salange, just in the beside, uh, that would be good enough, and uh, we'll have a good time together. That's what I learned, not to take out the daredevil. Daredevils will not l uh, live too much. So we had good luck, uh, but it was as well the pilot skills uh, to, to manage that and to fly, to continue to fly. Uh, if there would have been another thing, I would have landed probably in the forest, but in the way, so you have always to think. Uh, I, I was together with a man, with a man uh, who was a stunt pilot, and he told me, I would like to, uh, to, to write a, a book, How to Crash a Plane. So uh, what I think, and it's true, you always have to think how to crash a plane and to go away, because that can happen on a very simple flight at the yes. end of the runway when the motor stops. Yes. Then you go in the forest, you, you do something, uh, so, but continue to fly and continue to reflect. And this is uh, very important. You so have to break the fear, right? Yeah. But now uh, this, this story, it's a little bit long. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, a great story. So I would like to speak a little bit about uh, my, my passion. Uh, so uh, I started to fly and I, I uh, achieved a lot of things because the passion was so strong. Uh, so at a, one point of, uh, I was on the Aconcagua uh, in uh, 7,000 meters in the Andes, climbed there. And then I saw this beautiful landscape there and said, wow, I would like to fly here. Ooh. So, uh, and then probably it was due to this uh, lack, of, uh, lack of oxygen. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I saw these beautiful mountains and uh, I started to create a, a, a association which is called Mountain Wave Project because I really like to, like to fly with very strong winds. That is my passion. So thermals, the rich soaring yes. is, is quite nice, but flying in waves, these are uh, over the mountains, the Emmas is uh, climbing on the, on the uh, exposed side and then is descending. And there's a, f a physical aspect that, you, that creates wave and you can surf along these waves uh, like a surfer on the, on the seaside and you can make distances, unbelievable distance with that. So you're flying between uh, 2,000 and 10,000 meters. Uh, that's the problem of the glider is always that you, you use a lot of airspace. Yes. So, and uh, so I created this uh, in, a, in a sense, a little bit scientific organization. Uh, the first thing was I did, how can I fly there? It's much more easier when I say I'm flying for science. Uh, so uh, I started to fly in Argentina and uh, let's say 15 years later and 50 world records more, I said I, w I would like to change a little bit now the mountains. I know these mountains, they're beautiful. Uh, so where are other mountains? I say, okay, I flew on the longest change uh, uh, of the world uh, in the Andes and now I would fly in the highest mountains. So, and, and uh, I used the same thing, the Mountain Wave project, uh, to create a scientific project. And so with all the things that we did in the Andes, so I had the German aerospace, they were interested to make a mission uh, with three-dimensional cameras for glacier exploring uh, in the Himalayas. And uh, that was really 
a very interesting project. So we had two planes. You see this plane, the Stemmer plane. Probably you can make the, the, the first uh, uh, of my presentation, the first picture of my presentation. Um, Would you like uh, to navigate? Uh, next, it's just this, this one with yeah. the press. Okay. And the so cap, I'm sorry. Um, I do not have the presentation here. No, it should be here. But uh, you were saying, I'm sorry. Yeah. You were saying regarding you loving to climb really high mountains. And we all know that you were the first glider in history to have climbed Everest. Mm -hmm. Correct? Yes, yes. We would love to hear about that experience because I was watching your YouTube video and I saw the glider filled with ice. Yeah. I would like to have the presentation from the Himalayas. I do not know where, where yes. it is. If you can navigate, maybe it will. So anyway, but yeah, if I you will could tell us about the uh, yeah, Everest. Yeah, I will, I will tell something. So the first thing was, uh, of course, we had to go uh, to this place. Uh, it was not like we, when we are flying in, in Argentina, we are, uh, the, the gliders are transported with a container. Uh, but there we wanted to fly down. And this beautiful ship, the Stemme, uh, you can see it. Don't you have my, my uh, presentation I gave you yesterday? I think they are loading it now, but if you could keep on telling us about it, yeah. I promise you they will upload it uh, right so now. Uh, we had to fly down uh, to Kathmandu, so the glider is produced in Berlin, and we had a, la uh, a last, uh, a last uh, maintenance there, because it's a huge flight, 10,000 kilometers to fly down to Kathmandu. Uh, it was essentially in motor uh, propulsion, uh, because we had never the time uh, to stop you always uh, it's a run against the the, the time because uh, it's not night flight equipped so we had to fly from Berlin to Graz then we flew uh, to split in Croatia uh, next uh, step was then to Rodos and there was a quite a funny thing in Rodos uh, so I flew with an entrepreneur from Finland I flew a lot of in Argentina and he said wow this Everest stuff I would like to fly on the Everest this Everest stuff yeah <laughs> and uh, so he financed uh, the mission because it's quite expensive due to handling fees I'm and sure. so on we spent uh, around about 20,000 euro uh, just uh, in uh, fuel and uh, oh, wow. and, in, and the fuel is not the main part so we use around about 20 liters uh, on this plane per hour. Uh, so uh, in Rodos, uh, you know, I'm a glider pilot essentially, so I have a, a plane license as well, but when I saw all this presentation with Gulfstream pilots, and so these are all very professional, but I'm a small plane pilot, or I was, probably now I'm better. <laughs> you're a glider so legend, Klaus, yeah. not just a pilot, you're yeah, a legend. But, but uh, you know, it, the challenge is uh, then to fly down to Kathmandu and to make something like Gulf Streams. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, in Rodos, I, I was a little bit sponsored by Jeppesen, so I had all the Middle East maps, uh, IFR stuff, uh, but uh, in Rodos, just the GPS went away. And so I took out my compass before, so I had no compass, so I had to go from Rhodes to, uh, to Cyprus, and uh, mm, uh, no GPS, what did the you Turkish coast line, so the controller said we go via Alpha, where is Alpha? <laughs> Uh, so I oh could not even a bearing. So and we we flew then to Cyprus. So I could manage it. I, I had by good luck. You so Paul said about these maps. Yes. And I had the Jefferson maps in paper as well. So I could in the in the uh, moving map from the glider system. I could integrate uh, some points uh, to find Cyprus in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so and Ansi is a risk manager. Entrepreneur, he yes. said, you know, you should, we should buy a compass, and so. But did you didn't change your mind afterwards? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we, we, I, did you find the presentation? There are some nice photos of that. I can give you once again if you want. Uh, 
I promise you they should upload it now because they should have it. But we're enjoying our stories. You, you, I, I know that. We're enjoying your stories so much. And we can imagine the scenery just by you saying it. Yeah. Did you change your mind about the compass afterwards? Uh, yes. So uh, we, we had a look for, a, for a, a compass in Cyprus, but there was no aviation shop. But we found a, a diver compass. And uh, so we said, it it's probably a good idea to have a waterproof compass uh, because we had to cross from Cyprus to Aqaba and there's a lot of seaside and when you are landing in the water with a monomotor then probably you have a waterproof compass to, to uh, see in which direction to swim. Uh, so <laughs> uh, uh, as Ansi financed it so he had the compass on his arm so I had to follow him in, in case of... He had to off. follow his arm. <laughs> <laughs> so we went to Aqaba then, beautiful uh, stuff, and then from Aqaba we went to Hale. Uh, I was once again amazed uh, with the friendship of Sultan. He organized everything. Uh, we could land on a normal airfield, not international. Uh, the only thing, they had a little bit problem with the custom because they, they were not familiarized to, <laughs> to do with crews. <laughs> and then I landed in um, uh, Riyadh. And as I had this experience, I said, you know, Riyadh is a very big hub on an international airport. So That's I really huge. have to be familiarized with a situational awareness of yes. all the procedures uh, with the different, with two runways yes. and uh, probably two d different. So I, I learned mountain. three hours all the uh, IFR approaches. Of the other? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. So, uh, you know, aviation is always, you, you are growing. That, that's really, I learned a lot. Yes. Then we went uh, from, from Hale, we went uh, to Abu Dhabi. By the way, there were three brothers, the Al Dahiru brothers, uh, amazing reception as well. So Arabic hospitality, yes. there's really something very, very uh, interesting. And, and did you try uh, um, Arabic coffee, I think? Yeah. Did, did you try the Arabic coffee along with the Arabic hospitality? Uh, yes, of course, yes. of course. Uh, so, uh, funny thing, when we went out of Riyadh, uh, the controller said, uh, so we, we had, we, we went on airways, everything with uh, radar, with uh, transponder, uh, the glider was very well equipped, or a motor glider, and then, um, so the, the controller asked, sir, are you a monomotor? I said, yes, sir. I said, oh, good luck. <laughs> 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 because we had to cross the seaside, so we went to Abu Dhabi, went to Oman, and then we had uh, 900 kilometers of water uh, oh, to wow. Karachi was the next uh, step. And uh, it was really the worst place where you could have this red light, uh, low fuel pressure. <laughs> we, are f we, we were flying in 6,000 meters, uh, so that's amazing that this plane can fly uh, even up to 9,200 meters. That's incredible. So. Uh, and uh, in the middle between it, 450 kilometers, uh, we had this red light. So, and uh, I, I managed to have four electric pumps. I, I really checked everything, and finally it went away the red light. <laughs> uh, but in a normal plane, let's say a Cessna or something like that, I would would have been really in a bad situation. But the glider has a gliding ratio of nearly 50 kilometers with 1,000 meters. So we were always uh, in the range of an airport. Yes, and that's the beauty of it, right? Yes. And I read that in 1998, you founded a research group called Mountain Wave Project, correct? Yes, yes. And the core goal of that research group was to, to show the, the combination of science and adventure. Yes. So if you could tell us about that a uh, bit more. So the, the initial idea was to learn a little bit more about wave flights because uh, so you have some theories out of the 30s uh, and there were a lot of research. Uh, they have been uh, made, uh, most of them with, with motor planes. Uh, and so I, I, I wanted to learn more about that. You know, you, you, you have these beautiful lifts uh, which are lifting up in a laminar flow, so really no turbulence in the higher altitude. You can go up, the world record now is with a pressurized uh, uh, glider is 23,000 meters. It's oh, higher than wow. the most uh, business jet can fly. Oh, wow. uh, and they, they have the goal to reach eventually 27,000 meters. That would, be, that would be higher than any plane has flown, uh, oh, aerodynamic wow. planes. Uh, I think the Blackbird, he's something like 25,000 meters. Did you find 
the video. Uh, if we can know what's happening with the presentation, please. But again, Captain Klaus, I, yeah, I have, uh, we, I we don't want to stop hearing uh, your uh, stories uh, until they upload it. Can, can take it. So please, it's just a Riyadh, a Riyadh presentation. Because I have beautiful videos would be I, a I pity sure not to show them. I am sure you do. And uh, Captain, you have more than 30,000 hours, right? Yes, yes. Can we hear about, I mean, I know all aviators, they love risk and they hate risk at the same time. But we would love to hear about one of your most challenging flights that you can remember on spot right now and what you learned about it. Yeah, that was for me, uh, it was a flight, uh, a record flight in 2000, uh, in, uh, 2000 kilometers in 2003 I made it. So the, the story behind is uh, that uh, there was a man, he passed away uh, with 102 years just uh, three years ago, uh, Professor Joachim Kuttner, which was the father of the wave, I say it always. Uh, he was uh, a meteorological guy, a wonderful personality. Uh, he made the first, uh, he, his thesis was about waves and he explained how it works, waves in the Riesengebirge in Polonia now. And he used 23 gliders uh, to make the position in the wave, to make uh, to measure the longitude of the wave, and it was really amazing. Uh, uh, this man, and then he went after World War II. He went to United States. He was one of the three directors of uh, the NASA for the Mercury and the Apollo project. And uh, he, Werner von Braun uh, asked him to 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 join his team, and uh, so. In, the, in 1952, he had a big wave project in the Sierra Nevada, Sierra Nevada wave project. And um, he, he flew, it's still a, a German record, he flew up to 13,800 meters in a glider uh, in the jet stream and they measured turbulences because they had a lot of issues with mountain waves. They lo lost planes because you have a huge amount of turbulence in, in certain areas and they wanted to know more about that. And in 1952, when he did this flight, he had the vision and the idea to make 2,000 kilometers in one direction with a glider. Oh so my God. And there were old gliders, they had gliding ratio about 30, the best one. And so you should know that the first 1,000 kilometer flight straight ahead was only done in 1970, something like that. And he had this vision at 52. In 1952, I was born. Oh, wow. So, and then this guy, he said, that should be possible. And he had not too much time due to his scientific career. And he said, I would like to give a prize for the first glider pilot who will do that. And Joachim Kuttner, heard about my, my exploration flights in Argentina. And uh, so he wrote me a very nice letter. He presented himself and he said, yeah, uh, you know, I made this prize and uh, I think you can do that. All right, well, here we go. Another, this is another video, but this is from my last, last exploration. <laughs> it's not the Riyadh, but it's beautiful. So. This was in Argentina because this year we had a, a next uh, scientific with 50 scientists. And there you can see I'm flying the stemmer there. It's Beautiful. just a photo show. Beautiful. And this is in Lago Argentino in uh, uh, the south of Patagonia, a very nice area. Gorgeous. So with the third biggest ice field of uh, the world. And you live in southern France. And That's we flew, where we school. flew there with a with a stemmer, with two stemmers, and we had the opportunity to make some nice videos. And uh, there are some photos of that in our blog. It's beautiful. But Soaring Captain, you can't science, excite us called. like this about your most challenging story and not continue it. Yeah, this Let was, us know this what was happened. in Ar Argentina. And just to continue, uh, it was in this area where I started. So Joachim Kuttner asked me, you, you could do that probably. So 13.5 13 13 meters per second lift were there. 13.5 meters. Nice field. And uh, so Joachim Kuttner uh, said, you can do it probably. And I said, you, 
Joachim, I'm working for three years now on this project. He wanted to make with waves a tailwind flight. And uh, I said, no, I think it would be better to surf along the mountains, uh, but you need a huge extent of the wind field to do that. And uh, I said to him, I observed that sometimes the polar jet stream and the subtropical jets, which is in the north of uh, Argentina, they are coming close together. And then the wind field is large enough to do probably this flight. So I tried hard for three years. And in the fourth year, I could make this flight from the Patagonian ice fields oh, wow. uh, in this area uh, to the Atacama uh, in the eastern, in the Argentinian side, 2,100 kilometers in one direction. Oh, wow. Uh, was very funny you because... You made it happen. Yeah. Which it was, year was that? Yeah, it, it was amazing. So you, it was a flight of 15 hours. So, uh, 2,100. Uh, yeah, and you you need a lot of uh, speed and you need a lot of challenge because it's not one wave is uh, going along the Andes. You have uh, that's incredible. Uh, it's 30, 50 waves. You have to jump some things. You have uh, a lot of humidity very often, and so that's that was really the that's the, the, the most challenging flight. And the idea was to get the price from Joachim Kuttner. And this was really something. Did you found the Riyadh presentation, uh, PowerPoint presentation? It's on the stick. That's it. Oh, yes. No. So I will I will expedite now because, yes, because <laughs> I'm a little bit late. Unfortunately, so uh, it's uh, about passion, about visions and missions. So I can now check this. So this is the beautiful plane uh, that I used, uh, the Stemme. I have a Stemme like Sultan. That's another uh, connecting uh, link that we have. Uh, so you have a motor behind uh, the both pilots and in front you can see you can open the dome and there's a propeller. So this is a real plane with 23 meter wingspan, speeds Ooh. about 200 kilometers per hour, range of 1,400 kilometers. So we flew down uh, to Berlin. My friend, Ansi Sola, it's a little bit large. You can make it a little bit smaller, this picture. So because uh, we are cut in, okay. So uh, it looks not really like he's looking. That's much better. <laughs> <laughs> so Ansi uh, flew with me. He uh, himself has a stemmer and he flew from the North Cup to the South Cup. And so we had a lot of fun. Uh, so now you see some uh, seaside, uh, the Moving map, uh, 267 kilometers per hour. We flew in uh, 6,000 meters, uh, so you have a little bit more time before you uh, take out the raft, if ever you have a, a problem with the monomotor. And uh, so this is a compass you see b uh, below. The one, this is <laughs> the, the entrepreneur, right? Yeah, it, it uh, were, uh, probably helpful to swim in the right direction or to know from where, from which direction the sharks are coming. And uh, so uh, fuel was as well an issue. You see, uh, we had to make 100 liters of fuel, but there on international airports, you have not always uh, Afghas or uh, normal fuel. Ansi told me the story one time when he flew to Africa, they came with a 50 liter uh, bag and uh, they came on the, on the control and said, it's full of fuel. I said, what is that? Oh, it's 50 liters of fuel. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this is an issue. So we made uh, these three liter bags to fill 100 liters in the tanks. Uh, once again, we had really good help uh, from our friend Sultan. This is a colonel from uh, uh, the army, Saudi Arabia. I called him always Mr. No Problem because whatever you wanted, he said no problem. No problem. No problem. <laughs> no problem. Sultan Again. Baghdadi, very nice guy. And he helped us here in Riyadh. Uh, uh, funny thing it was as well when I went, uh, the, the, the controller said we go to the general aviation uh, parking. And I looked always to find uh, small planes, but I did not. The first plane on the general aviation was a 747. <laughs> <laughs> not close to a glider, no. <laughs> yeah. So we had a good time and uh, really the, a lot of hospitality. Uh, but now just about the mission that we had. Uh, so we had the three-dimensional photos. We had two types of plane. One uh, was uh, with 
uh, oh, now it's, it's going away. It was just good. <laughs> Our time is out. Just look at this last video. You have some music with that? Oh, that's a beautiful looking lion. So this is, uh, uh, these are the pots that we had uh, below the wings. Four different cameras. It was composite pictures then uh, built in the computer together. So now you see the Everest, the Kumbu Glacier. I had to fly with the plane in the oh, Kumbu wow. Glacier. And this was a 10 centimeter resolution uh, that we had, uh, the cameras. These are these, these pictures, so and this very, very precisely, so you can measurement for geological purposes, uh, glacier control, and uh, so you, you should imagine that when you have a, a, a expedition with geologues, they have to go there with Sherpas, with everything, you could do that in one day, what they have in six, six weeks. Wow. So it's really interesting. This was a storm. Uh, that we had on the Everest, and we flew with this storm. That's the Auntie. video I saw. Yeah. Look at that ice. And he was so happy because we were close to the Everest, not too close, because we had 185 kilometers wind per hour. This is a five-star uh, hurricane, if you oh want. Oh my God! <laughs> and there were really a lot. You you can see some uh, some turbulences that we had there. It's the uh, Kumbu Glacier. But you made history, Captain Klaus. You you are the first glider yeah. in history to go over that Everest. That was the first time we flew on the Everest with a motor glider, and I had the opportunity to do that uh, just at the end of the mission. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, that was Look. there was no. Now you see a little bit the turbulences that we had there. I tried to film. <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't, huh? <laughs> And but look at the wing, uh, I, I, it's really good that I was in the glider because it's very Ooh. resistant. <laughs> Ooh. And uh, so this was uh, the first exploration flight that I had. And then I had a last video, which is look at that. three minutes uh, uh, when I flew Un above the Everest. I don't want to finish, and I just want to keep on asking you about your gliding experience because you gave me thrills just looking at this. You've made history, Captain Klaus, as a glider. You've made history in the aviation industry, and we thank you on behalf of all gliders and all aviators. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for your attention. <laughs> if you want to see the video on the glider, you just say Klaus plus Everest, and you will see the gliding stuff along this beautiful day with where the wind was just smooth S and just I could smooth. fly yeah. along the reaches of the Everest. Beautiful. It was a dream and it was really... Beautiful. You know, so beautiful. To encourage you, uh, when you have dreams, just continue. So dream your life, but don't forget to live your dream. Yes. Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Captain. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.